that certainly gave us a wonderful um, image of our desired state. And we're now going to have our closing speaker talk to us about the Lancet Commission report, Where Do We Go Next? Dr. Laura Magnana has a bachelor's degree in education, a master's degree in educational technology, and a PhD in educational administration. She has more than 30 years experience in public and private universities in Mexico, educational organizations in the United States, the United Nations programs and NGOs in Central America and Europe. Among her multiple positions, she's been the advisors coordinator in the special education department of Mexico State educational consultant for UNICEF, Dean of the School of Education, University of the Americas, Executive Director of the Mexican American Institute of Cultural Affairs, and Dean of the School of Education and Human Development at La Salle University. For the last 10 years, she's been the Academic Dean of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, leading the most important educational and technological innovations of the school in its 92 years of existence. Please help me in welcoming Laura. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really my great pleasure to have been here for this very exciting workshop. And, and this is a, a big challenge to actually end up the workshop. So I'm, I'm sure some of the ideas I'm going to be uh, presenting, of course, it has been already talked about in this these two days. So hopefully it's more like a motivated uh, talk in the sense as just to go now to keep on with this, uh, the challenge of continue the, the changes. So very quickly, I'm going to be just uh, summarizing why we need to change. And, and I'm going to do that uh, talking about the health, the pressure and the challenges we have in the health system and the pressure and the challenges we have in the education system. Then I'm going to recall very quickly what were the recommendations in the Lancet report. And the most important part would be the end. What's the next step? And the next step you have already said it since yesterday. We need a radical change. So we need to reinvent our health professional education system. I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. Well, first of all, we are at least in between two systems that both of them are really challenging us that we need to change. There are some challenges in the health system that are really demanding more professional and more qualified health workforce. And from the other side, from the side of the supply, we're actually having uh, an, an educational revolution that I'm gonna show you why, that is pressing, that's pressing ourselves in terms to change. Uh, if we talk about the health system, and I'm just gonna talk about uh, four, there, there are more, but I'm gonna just uh, talk about four main of uh, things that are really pressuring, pressuring our, our health education in order to change. The first one, we all know uh, that we're living in an epidemiological and demographic transition. So we already know the challenge of the, the elderly. We already know that we are really living with, with the chronic disease and the obesity and diabetes are already beginning to be overwhelmed for the health systems around the world. And number two, I would like to, to, to stress the importance that in the world, in the globalized world, we still have a challenge in terms of poverty and huge disparities, not only between and inside the countries, not only between, but inside also the countries, as identified by the report of social determinants of health. And I'm sure you know these reports. So I just want to say that, for example, just in one indicator, life expectancy, we already know that just, just a girl because she was born in Sierra Leone, she can be expected to live half the time, uh, of, uh, that means 42 years, that if that particular girl who had been born in Japan, which is 86 years old. And also the chance of a child dying before age five in Angola is 90 times higher than in Finland. Those are the kind of inequalities that we have in our world. But those uh, uh, disparities is not just between the countries. It is within the countries. And um, I, I just put this example just because we are here in DC. But the inequalities here in health are, are also within uh, wealthy countries like the USA. For example, where here in DC, uh, every mile from here to the northwest of the city counts for a year in life expectancy. Access. And quality of care. I mean, these are main challenges that, that we all are facing in our countries. Our health systems are still struggling 
to find ways to give services to all people in economically constrained times. And of course, we have been talking since yesterday a lot in terms of globalization. So every global event has local consequences. Every local action has global implications. And this is just to give us a flavor of what's going on in terms of the health systems. But if we talk about education, the educational system and what's going on there, we know that we're living really an educational revolution due to the emergence of the information and communication technologies. We live a new type of society. We're all living in this new type of society. I mean, and also I'm going to just mention a few of the, these features. For example, accessibility of internet. That's growing every day. Higher education institutions could no longer pretend to be the ones with the knowledge to transmit to the students because this is no longer true. That used to be true, but it's no longer true. So instead, the education system has to prepare the students with skills that will make them capable to find accurate information, to discriminate the information, to analyze the information, to compare, and to judge. This morning, we were talking about this uh, curriculum obesity. What we need to do is just to change and, and, and give more time to the skills that the students need in order to find that information and to, and to know how to, what to do with the information rather than to keep on filling the curriculum with content. Uh, number two, people are expected to work, to learn, and to study from wherever they are. So mobile technology has moved the traditional classroom to a mobile classroom. Every time we, we see more of this happening, we have all our computers, our iPads, and we are learning while we are waiting in the, in the office, while we are in the metro. So the concept of campus and learning is no longer associated to a physical facility, but to the possibility of a remote access and connectivity. So are we really aware of these changes? Are we, our university, are expanding more in virtual environments? Or are we still asking for money to, to, to have bigger and bigger uh, facilities? The, uh, okay. the technology is more cloud-based now. So this means that students can access information everywhere, device independent, new ways to store, to share, and to work, collaborate. But you know what? We still are relying a lot in paper, like in handouts, in, 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 in things that we do and then we give to to the students rather to really have a beneficiary of, of all that technology. We also need to realize that we have a mobile society. The 21st century started with new ways of organization. Labor, life, political and economic structure rely heavily in knowledge and technology and greater mobility of goods, services and people and values. Interconnected world. So networks are the basics for productivity, economic growth, and creation of new ways to relate each other uh, for the common good. And we all may think that uh, the new types of society is just about technology. So if we think that way, maybe we said, OK, and maybe the classroom uh, is, is like this. We all have computers, so, so that's a perfect classroom. But you know what? It's not about technology, or it's not just about technology. Because if I see what are all these students are doing, then it will be kind of frustrated because most of the people are Twitter, are watching uh, videos, they are chatting with their friends, they are doing, uh, they're ga uh, playing games, uh, they are doing other things, and just maybe this, this one person is paying attention to the class. So it's not just about technology. We're going to see that it's about pedagogy. We need to engage the students in order to really uh, ensure that learning is happening. So technology helps, but it's not just about technology. Uh, the professional work, as we have uh, said a lot in these two days, is increasingly multidisciplinary and collaborative in nature. So education has to reflect this change. The curricula, the learning activities, the professor's roles, they have to include the multidisciplinary, transprofessional approaches, and institutions have to link to work together uh, towards nets and alliances who are facilitated now by, by technology. New actors, multiple stakeholders. Holders. I mean, our world has really become very complex. This is a real uh, uh, situation in one city, small village in Africa. 
These are all the actors involved in that particular village. And I'm not kidding, <laughs> it's real. So that means it's not about, this morning we're talking about resources. Sometimes it's just that we are not, we really, we really are very fragmented. We don't really work, we don't know how to work in an integrated uh, uh, word or effort. So now our students, they need to really be able to work together toward a common good, but talking also with people not only in the health sector, but also in, in the private, in other sectors, in foundations, in other, all the stakeholders that are now uh, in place. So in sum, health professional education is facing the same revolutionary pressure that 100 years ago forced the professionalization of medical and public health and also nurse schools worldwide. We know that 100 years ago, we had the Flexner Report, the welch Ross Report, and the Goldmark Report that really transformed our educational, well, health education. And that's why the Lancet Report, it came out five years ago as a response of those 100 years of, of health uh, professional education. Now, the Lancet Report uh, that I'm sure you all know very well, it, uh, it gave us some really very important reforms that we needed need to do in terms of instructional and institutional reforms. They talk about the enabling actions to the, uh, the, the general goal in really to have transformative and interdependent professional uh, in order to really uh, stress our current challenges. And I'm going to just uh, uh, put this couple of, of uh, 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 overheads were saying that uh, these are the main recommendations of the report. And just going through that, because it's yesterday and today, I mean, it was very uh, enthusiastic to see there are some examples, some good examples of that people is really trying to do uh, different things. For example, number one, the adoption of competency-based curriculum. Most of our associations are already doing that or have already completed really competency-based curricula. We're already talking about how can we do interprofessional uh, education. We are really trying hard to incorporate IT for learning. And last night, we have a great experience of, of, of seeing what are the new things. We have global resources that we are now trying to, to, to really to share. Uh, we're thinking about how to integrate new professionals in, in our curriculum. And there are others that are may, we might not at least uh, have, have good stories or good success in terms of how are we really advancing, for example, in joining the planning mechanism between, for example, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of, of Education. And there are other uh, like networks and alliances that already universities have already undertaken. But I think the, the last one, uh, uh, nurturing of a culture of critical inquiry. What are we doing in the classroom itself? So these are the 10 main recommendations. I think there are some isolated good efforts in order to really have to, to, to do these recommendations. But the main uh, really advancement, we have not really see it yet. So what is the next step? Is what we really not, we don't need just experiences here, experiences there, maybe this department is changing, maybe this, I mean, this helps in order to see how, how we can scale up some of the experiences, but we really need a radical change. We need to reinvent the whole thing. We need to reinvent, of course, we need to learn what we're doing good, but we really need to do more. We need to reinvent our health professional education systems. Our world has changed in the past hundred years uh, and higher education has not changed uh, or has changed very little. These two photographs are real. One is 200 years ago, the first one, and the second one is, is one of our universities. I mean, you can see that, I mean, it's almost the same. <laughs> I mean, uh, really, we, we don't change. I mean, education has not really changed. And we are far from yesterday, what Susan in the opening uh, word said, we're far from preparing our students for, for, the, for the current and future scenarios. So it's, it's an urgent need to revisit everything, our mission, our goals, our strategies, our organization. In particular, I'm going, I'm going to talk about some of very specific things that we can do, but because there's some things that we say, okay, but we need money to do this, we need a political, and, and yes, that's true, we need all those things. But at least in our hands is to change some very specific things that I'm sure we can do really a big advancement in, in the agenda. 
First of all, the curriculum. The curriculum is in our hands. We really urge to have less content specific and more cross-cutting competencies. We keep on saying that we need this, we need the other, and, when, and, and we already have a curriculum with obesity curriculum, so it's, it's not a way that we can have all that information in our curriculum. And according to a study, it is foreseen that by 2020, knowledge will be doubled every seven, three days. So, and students have immediate access to internet and to find information to challenge the professor and go beyond the classroom. So why spend time in an activity that our students can find in their own? But we need more skills. We don't have the thinkers that this world needs. We don't have the problem solvers that this world needs. So we need to really start thinking about uh, reducing the content of the curriculum and giving more experiential learning to really be doing more of the cross-cutting uh, competencies. Second one, and we have talked about this issue in the, these two days. Uh, we need general content first. We cross-cutting, transdisciplinary, transprofessional, and not really, and not just in the health profession. We also need the architects, and we need the engineering, and we need the other people who are doing other things related to, to health. And then field specific, and, and I'm glad that I'm not going to talk more about that because that has been uh, uh, show up in some of the of, of the tables. We need to realize that the, that the that the focus has changed. So from acute episodes that we had to chronic disease, from care specific to prevention to health promotion to lifestyles, and you know what? Globally, only 10% of our curriculum, of the health professions curricula, is on health promotion. So we, it's an urgent need that the very few things that we left the content has to do with health promotion, lifestyles, and how I want to change the way we, we live. Uh, we can offer flexible curricula. We are so used to have a tubular view. All the students have to have these prerequisites. They enter, they take these uh, 160 or whatever uh, credits they have to have, this particular map, and they go out. But we don't have that kind of students anymore. We need to have a kaleidoscope view, meaning that it doesn't matter how, where they enter. It depends on their skills. What are the, the skills that they already have? What's the knowledge that they already have? Where they can fit in the curriculum? What do they need to have very personalized and has to be very competencies oriented? If they have the competencies, they got it. Maybe they have already competencies that they already have. They don't have to, to come to the, to the tubular view. We have already uh, extensively talked about that in order to engage our students, I mean, we have a lot of evidence in terms of the cognitive area that says that if we do not have an active learning, people is not here, regardless of the technology, regardless of the lecture, but we need to be engaged. So we already know that. So if we're going to have a, uh, medicine based on, on evidence, we have to have learning uh, based on evidence. And the evidence says that the, the, the students need to be engaged, they need to be uh, active in the classroom, so we have to really make that to happen, that change. And in order to do that, of course, we need another kind of professors. Our faculty, uh, we all are uh, with different competencies. We need new competencies. We need to know about pedagogy, we need to know about technology, because now it's not about me teaching, it's about my students learning. So I need to concentrate on the learner. So my role is different, it's just, the change. So I need to be concentrated on how to design learning environments, how to motivate, to accompany, and to coach my students in order for them to learn. My students have changed too. So basically I have now two kinds of uh, uh, students. We have the adults that are actually returning to school due to changes and new labor competencies, and they need really the training. But we also have very, very young students that are eager to continue formal training. They are very technological oriented. They are more comfortable with digital networks than a face-to-face -face discussion. They're used to multisensorial environments. They are less patient. They are more practical and ready to demand the fulfillment of their own needs. So, are we really allowing all these profiles in our schools? Are we changing our environment uh, to do that? We have already talked in these two days also about the learning environments. We need to really be talking more about the fleet classroom, 
to be involved more e-learning, e-learning, we talk about MOOCs. So maybe a discussion that is left, and hopefully we have later uh, in another workshop the opportunity to talk about is that maybe we need to change or to move to certification of competencies. So it doesn't matter where you learn it. Maybe you learn it in a MOOC, maybe you learn it in another university, maybe you learn it in the, in the, in the workplace, but as long as you have the competency, then you, you are already uh, uh, have that. So uh, we also uh, need to, to, to start doing more things together. Uh, there's, a, there's a call to, to the, that, that come from standalone institutions to really, we already have the technology in order to do networks, more alliances and consortia, and we re really need to start working together uh, and doing this more. Okay, in conclusion, I want you to see this cartoon as one of my conclusions. Well, first of all, I think we should really have to start working together. It's not academia and researchers and, and, and doing all the papers, but actually we need to start talking about uh, and with the policy makers in order to, to really make this happen. And this very last uh, uh, conclusion, in order really to reinvent our education, to prepare our students for current and future challenges, we have to create a space to think about the future. So uh, that's why I think this is an excellent opportunity, this workshop, to really leave our workplace and come in our very heavy agendas and just to think. We need to think about the future. How are we going to do this? We need to involve different actors, all the stakeholders, inside and outside the health sector in order to help us all build our future. And we all need, in this, in this uh, all the people who is right here sitting here, to provoke, to support to stimulate and to lead the educational change. I don't think somebody else is gonna do it. You have to do this, we all have to do this. So we, are, we need to act now, we need to disseminate what we are doing, and we need to scale up uh, all everything that we're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you so very much. You asked us to uh, provoke and stimulate and I think you have definitely provoked and stimulated us. So we, uh, we appreciate ending on such an energetic note. So thank you for coming. A um, couple of housekeeping things. First of all, you should have all received a workshop evaluation. Uh, you are welcome to fill that out in paper form and turn it, in, turn it in at the registration table. I can't talk anymore. Uh, you're also welcome to fill it out electronically. You'll be getting that uh, within the next couple of days, Patricia, I assume. Uh, certainly, if you would like to just talk to Patricia directly about it, or if you'd like to, I'll speak for Beth. Uh, if you'd like to speak to, uh, to either Beth or I, uh, we would be happy to, uh, to take your feedback that way as well. Um, I, I, I'm really struck by the, the remarkably broad ranging conversations that we've had over the last day and a half. Uh, I hope you found it uh, enjoyable. I hope you found it engaging and perhaps even productive in, in your own work. And perhaps you can take a nugget back uh, already and, and start thinking about provoking and stimulating change in your own institutions. Uh, on behalf of Beth, uh, I want to thank all of our committee members. I want to thank all of our speakers and facilitators and discussion leaders. Uh, I certainly want to thank Patricia and uh, Megan and Bridget uh, for all of the work that they've done and all the rest of the IOM staff who have worked so hard to, to bring this off. Um, I look forward to, uh, to the report that will come from this. I'm, I'm actually, can honestly say, I'm looking forward to working on this. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to pull this together. Uh, even though Patricia does all the heavy lifting, um, it will be fun. So um, please stay for lunch if you are able. Continue the conversation. Uh, but whenever you do need to leave, uh, travel safely. And we'll look forward to seeing you all again next time. So thank you very much. Thank you.